And hey everyone, and welcome to episode 101 of the Self Publishing Roundtable, the podcast for indie authors by indie authors, where we discuss today's topics and issues that matter to the business of the self published author. I am your moderator, Wade Finnegan, and my co panelists, well, are Xavier Granville. No, hi, Internet. <laughs> uh, it should be Michelle Reed, but we need to have to make a last-minute substitution. So off the bench came Mr. Matt Morris. Off the bench. I'm, yeah, I'm, as soon I will be turning my camera off because I am fulfilling the role of, of Michelle Reed. <laughs> well, I thought that's why you had the pirate hat on. Oh, no, You're that's still me. hiding your face. Oh, that's me. And our special panelist this week, returning, we didn't scare her off, is one Chrissy <laughs> Moss. Say hello, Chrissy. Hi. <laughs> uh, we brought Chrissy back on tonight to discuss uh, a very important topic that often gets overlooked, and that topic is the, the time between you get done typing and think, oh, yes, my manuscript is done, until the time you actually hit publish, that whole uh, area there that, uh, frankly, for some people, kind of scares them a little bit. So um, Chrissy is just, yeah, it is intimidating. And Chrissy just so happens to be getting ready to go across that bridge again with her second novel. And I, if I would have been professional, I would have asked before the show start, what is the title of that second novel? <laughs> Which is Curse. Which is Curse, okay. Which will be uh, on your uh, digital shelves soon. Um, but uh, she's Next month. Next month. So you have an actual release date set? I, I hesitate to actually release a date. Um, I'm hoping by the 7th, but cool. I'm shooting for the 1st. Nice, nice. So, yeah, so we're going to talk all about that process of um, what do you do when you actually hit type the end and get it ready to go to market. So, um, as always, we encourage everyone listening live to leave your questions, comments, uh, be part of the show. We love our live viewers. We love all our viewers and all our listeners, but live viewers make it special. Um, and of course, at the end of the show, please take a moment to leave us a review, as Matt would always say, a five-star review, and only five-star reviews, uh, over there on iTunes, uh, or a thumbs up, or a share, that sort of stuff. Helps us to keep the show viable. We do appreciate it. Um, before we get started, too, I will give a little shout-out to Xavier, even though he didn't know I was going to. He's also just released two short stories. Uh, Xavier, give us the titles of those, please. Um, I got one that's called Homecoming, and that's a, uh, a thriller horror. Um, and then the other one's called uh, Flowers Out of Time, which is kind of a uh, sci-fi with a little bit of a romance, but not in a lovey-dovey kind of way. It's it's a pretty sad story. Oh, very interesting. So go check those out for Xavier too. So, all right, uh, to get us started, uh, Chrissy. Um, I think we'll we'll probably start in the the editor area. Of course, you can kind of take this wherever you want. But it, actually, last week we hinted about this a little bit in our uh, chaotic discussion. But um, what do you do to get your book ready to go to an editor? And then we'll kind of pass it down the line too. For um, I give it another read and try to um, straighten out you know, anything that's gotten mixed up or any sentences that have gone astray and things like that. Um, I, especially with it being such a long work, I will ha I have repetition in there sometimes where something um, is explained like two or three times in the novel instead of just the once. So I'll have to go through and pull those out. Um, just another pass with the spell check and everything, you know, Doing as much as I can to get it ready, but I don't want to spend more than maybe twice doing that after all of the said and done, or else I'm just doing it forever, and the editor can do a much better job than I can. Now, do you do a developmental edit or just a line edit with your editor? Um, no, with the last book, I actually had somebody who um, read it and gave me you know, some advice on what was missing. And that was very helpful. Um, this one, I don't have somebody to do that for me, so I'm just sending it to the editor. Cool. Matt, how about your process when you get ready to for your edits? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, 
I basically just uh, I started. So when I finish the first draft, especially, I'll I'll go back to the beginning and, and my my revisions. I just go I, I work through it again, right? And so mm-hmm. um, while doing the first draft, I'll make note of like all the big things I want to do, get through it, and then when I'm done with my second draft, honestly, like I'm I'm really there. So at this point, I'm not working. That would be the normal stage where I would send it to a whatever editor, developmental editor, line editor, whatever the case is, whatever I'm looking for. Lately, I haven't been working with developmental editors very much anymore. I've worked with some in the past. Um, because I'm able to, I think, better plan just those smaller stories and and better handle the arcs and, and whatnot whenever I break them down that way. Um, so at that point, that's when, I mean, I'll go back and, and uh, I'll send it to some beta readers at that point, but essentially my editing stage stays with me for the most part. But that would be normally where I would break it off and send it to an editor as necessary. Cool. Xavier, how about you? Um, well, I guess I'll uh, talk about the the short stories for for that and the ones that I just recently put out because those ones um, were different from how I had put out with Dinosaur Noir. Um, so with the short stories, I had sent those off to um, a friend of mine, Scott Richards, and he had edited those. And as as well as as doing a line edit, he was he gave me a lot of developmental notes. So I went back and made some changes to those. Um, but these were the uh, ones that I did about a year ago. So um, I might go back through um, and retype everything at some point. I'm not sure, um, and just to kind of update it, but. For the time, I, f- I felt like I wanted to put up, uh, you know, just some short stories that really are non-committal reads, and um, and that kind of and that worked in, in that in that sense because it was a quick way to uh, get a shorter fiction out faster. Um, but at, in the same sense, with uh, when it was the larger uh, work, like Christy said, both you know those uh, take a lot more attention. Um, mm-hmm. So, when I finished Dinosaur Noir, at least the first draft, I had did a couple read-throughs, and I like to um, read it on different um, devices. So I'll I'll put it on uh, on my Kobo, and I'll I'll read it that way because you know just like a, a a different font text, you know these these things uh, that'll change how you look at it, and a mistake that you know might have eluded you before might seem clearer just by switching from Times New Roman to Ariel and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, fr- from there, um, I had gone with beta readers and um, got a lot of good f- feedback and even uh, restructured the both the first chapter and the, uh, the, the later end of the book based on how pe- people had made some comments of, as far as how I should execute it. So from there, that's when I contacted the editor. And then um, he was giving me line edits and de- developmental notes along the way. So it was two, he d- did two passes of that, um, and then I had the final, and then gave it another couple reads, once on the, co- on the Kobo, and then once in Scrivener, as I'm doing that final output to the file, so because I'm, I'm I'm always doing those last minute checks within the compiling process as well. Interesting. Do any of you guys uh, print it out and and look at it that way? Not anymore. I used to, especially with short stories, but I I feel so bad for the trees. <laughs> yeah. I never if have. I had, never if have. I, if I had a um, like a laser printer, that w- that would be something to consider. And you know, uh, I I don't I don't know. I, I don't think it's uh, affordable. And I think that's yeah. kind of a, a, a kind of a ca- case for the, <laughs> the the traditional book industry in itself, right there. I mean, well, if you want to do something yeah. something similar, I, I'll compile mine using Scrivener into a PDF, and then I, I have a PDF app on my iPad, and I mark that up. If if mm-hmm. I wanted to do something like that, I'll just I'll do it. Like, I'll do it that way. Oh really? Okay. So yeah. your iPad allows you to, to write right on it with a with that app. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a few apps that'll do it. Um, and you just search a little bit, you'll find one. They're not, they're, they're pretty common. Um, and you can just do mock-up PDFs. And I have a little stylus or whatever for like 10 bucks that I got, and I can just go through there and mark it up that way. Oh, very cool. That's a good idea. I, I, I do like color coding when I'm editing stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, not doing it in Scrivener, um, I think, would be difficult. But You can uh, color code well, your comments in Scrivener. Yeah, that's true. You can do that. When I'm going through editing, I will actually change the color of the, the font. So I will change it to green or something because I've already edited that, and I'll keep going. And it's uh, it's nice because I can see how far I've gotten, and it encourage me, cur- encourages me to keep going. Um, so you do that directly in Scrivener. Scrivener or a Word app or you know anything that works. Well, and what I like, and I I just discovered this like uh, a little while ago, where um, if you're in the track changes mode in uh, Word, then that's usually how. Um, both either Scott and and Jason, both both people I've had edit my work, uh, mm-hmm. t- tend to send me stuff. Um, if you're copying um, everything fr- from Scrivener to Word, um, I notice that if if you're doing it with the track changes mode on, it'll, Scrivener will pick up on the comments and it just moves them right over. Oh. That's interesting. That oh, that's a that's a nice little tip there. I didn't, I didn't know that. Did not know I did that. I know, and I, you and I just import. found that. You can't. I don't think you can direct import track changes. Like it won't know that track changes has happened. Or is that what you're saying? Have they changed that? It just it, it doesn't change them from track changes. It it turns them into comments. Yeah. So you can keep the comments that way. Yeah. Exactly. So so those uh, same um, things that were highlighted as being either you know either developmental change or, or line editing change, um, mm-hmm. that it'll stay um, highlighted in Scrivener, but it'll be uh, converted into a comment. That's that's interesting. Cool. I did not know that. Learn something new here on the roundtable. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so we send it off to an editor, right? That's, that's usually step <laughs> number one, or we edit ourselves, depending on what you're doing. Um, what would you guys say is the next thing to do to get things ready to publish? Well, if you haven't got a cover, you have to figure that out really fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you haven't got a cover at that point, you're way behind the game. That's true. <laughs> well, exactly. Okay, so Matt, when, when would you suggest doing your covers? When do you usually start working on your cover? As soon as I know I'm going to write a book. I do it about maybe like halfway through because then I know what the book's about. Um... Matt works a lot faster than most people. <laughs> oh, no, I just know that a book cover doesn't have anything to do with what the book's about. Doesn't it? It doesn't have to, no. Absolutely. It doesn't have to, no. It, it, needs, that to, is it needs to fit the genre. That's it. Yeah. Well, sometimes I don't even know what genre it is until I'm halfway through the book. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, and, I, I, I have a trouble with that. Genre. Yeah, I, even though I think it's in a certain genre, I have trouble with that, too. So, okay. How about you, Xavier? How, how soon do you start working on your cover? Um... Yeah, like Matt said, I do have, sometimes I will work on, on a cover right when I have the idea of, of a book. Sometimes I find that kind of gives me a little bit of inspiration to get the book done because I'm just like, you know, I already have a clear picture of this being uploaded because that's the cover. All I need to do is, is fill the, the book. Um, but uh, it depends. Like uh, for the Dinosaur Noir uh, series, you know, I, I had a couple different versions of that uh, cover, so that was an ongoing thing. Um, but now that I have a kind of established thing uh, look that I'm happy with, um, now I'm doing like I, I have the the cover for the second book kind of half done right now, and I'm almost done writing the book, so I'll have to. Uh, one thing that I have have to do for the cover before I finish the book. So just so that way it's better timing that when I get the edits back I'll already have the setup of both my Kindle uh, cover and also CreateSpace too. 
Hmm, interesting. Okay. Uh, Chrissy, I know you just used, uh, at least for your last book, right? Or this book, I should say, right? I think 99 Designs, mm -hmm. or was that the last one? I'm... I used it for both of them. I, well, I used it for the last book, and I ended up with two good designs that I liked, and so I got, grabbed them both. Oh, that was a good idea. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, can you just share a little bit how your experience was with that? I, I know we've heard a lot about it, but I don't know if I actually have ever talked to somebody directly that did the whole process. So. Well, it's it's really simple. Um, you tell them what you want, and you give them some de description, and you start getting pictures in. Um, the a lot of the ones I got when I first when it first went up were not that great. <laughs> it's, you get some really bad ones, and then you start thinking, these are terrible. Why did I do this? And then all of a sudden, somebody will pop in there with this really amazing, great picture, and you're like, oh. That's why I did this. <laughs> At least that's how my experience went. Um, the worst part was for me that people kept asking me, well, why didn't I choose them? And I didn't want to just say, because your, <laughs> your cover was terrible. <laughs> so I had to figure, you know, tell them, you know, this is what threw me off. The font, I didn't like the font. It doesn't say this genre. Or it's not, you know, it's too small or whatever. And, um... You know, you get a lot of people who are this, they're, they're trying, they're just learning, and it's clear that they're just learning, but you also get some really great pick people who do some fantastic art, and of course you don't have to pay if you don't find anything you like, which is good. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I think I was really smart you grabbed two, that way you had your next cover already dialed in, so. Well, yeah, and then I told the second person... You know, I love the font on this one. Can you make the font for this one match? And she did, and it worked out really good. So, same kind of font, same color, same style. Two different artists. Very cool. Very cool. And, of course, Xavier does do a lot of uh, cool stuff himself, too. I know a lot of times he doesn't like to boast about his work, but I, I will for him because it, it is pretty awesome. Um, if Mich Michelle were here, I'm sure she would uh, do that as well. Have her camera off. <laughs> we'll have her camera off, except maybe maybe screen share her book cover because he, he did an awesome job. <laughs> so, um, thank you. Yeah, it's very very good. Okay, so we've edited. We've got we got a book cover, and if we're like Matt, we've already had our book cover for a while. Um, now, what do we do? We we got it. We got to get it somehow, some way out to the public. What sort of things? Should people be really concerned about maybe some things, some tips that you guys would say that, okay, make sure you do this before you hit that publish button? Go ahead, Chrissy. Um, <laughs> yay, put me on the spot. That's right. <laughs> I would say open it in your, your Kindle or on your phone or something so that you can see what it actually looks like. Um, I put a map in mine. And I still cannot get the map to look right in on a phone or in a Kindle, but it looks great in the book, <laughs> at, you know, the print book. So, um, yeah, just open it in whatever device you're going to be using and take a good look at what it actually looks like, because the the um, formatting can be tricky sometimes. Okay, good. That's good, Matt. Yeah. I I guess I'm gonna. I would ask, like, where are we really at with it? So it's like, are we assuming the book is completely done, 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 done? Like it's ready to be published? Well, after well, the edits and stuff. Let's see, yeah. Okay. Well, so, if, so like formatting. So for example, formatting is one of the things that I do, and part of formatting would be yeah, check it on all devices, make sure it looks good. Yeah. Um, formatting is key. Yeah, formatting is important. It's not super, super. Like you don't need to do anything crazy. It just needs to look mm -hmm. clean. That at a yeah. base minimum, and that is. There's not a huge range. Like you, you're not going to blow people's mind with amazing formatting. You're just going to make them okay with it. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing about formatting is it shouldn't be noticed, really. Yeah, that's what I, right. That's what I was throw it needs to be legible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know that. So that's good. I mean, it depends on where you're at. So if we're having this discussion, I'm assuming that it's directed at people that are have not published a lot because they're wanting to figure out, okay, how should I, how should I be going about this? Right. Um, I would have. Uh, you need to make sure at this point when you've got a book that's essentially done but not yet published, this is when I would start submitting that to my reviewers. So people that I have lined up to review the book, um, they're going to start getting early editions of it so that they can start reading it. 
Um, this is also when I start sending out some kind of like newsletters and doing some early promo and like, hey, I've got a book coming out on whatever. If I'm at this point, I already know when the book's coming out or I can decide when the book's coming out. I could set up a pre-order for it or I could not and I could just tell people about it. Would you do um, a pre-order even if it's your, fir it your first book still? Would you still do a pre-order? Uh, maybe. I could see some value there, mainly for getting reviews up early. Um, but to be honest, I would. I think I would rather the, the hit to be... Um, it's so hard. I mean, that's such. A, that's almost an entirely different conversation. Um, I get. I could be fine with either way. I. I don't. I don't think that there's any for me any clear cut way of which one's better. I could make arguments both ways. Um, but I would say only if you know you can hit that date. Oh it, yeah. If, if you're going to make sure that you. If you say you're going to yeah, release yeah. it, you got to release it right. You have to release it right. Yeah. And so I. If if it's your first book, I would wait until the book is done to even set up. So that that's not an issue. That you can focus on different things. Um, yep. But if you're at the point where the book is essentially done, yeah, you need to you need to have your reviewers lined up. I would be doing that throughout while you're finishing the book, uh, of of lining up reviewers. Um, get as n there's no cap on that, by the way. Zero, a thousand people, five thousand doesn't matter. No cap, as many as you no. can. And um, so I would start sending it to them, and then I would start doing some kind of early promo, and I would get just start doing the marketing for it until the book <clears> is published, <throat> whenever whether that's tomorrow or a month from now. Interesting. Uh, on all those reviewers, you give them the book for free for a review. Is, absolutely. Is, absolutely. Do they? Do they? Is there a rule that they have to say that in the review that they got that book for free? Absolutely not. Okay. I, I don't know. I thought I thought I heard some point. Some Amazon was really worried. A lot of people say that you should because they think it's kind of sketchy. But people have been doing that for century, or for you know, since the print right. books came out, they've been giving advanced reader copies away, so that mm. they give them to magazines, they give them to book review clubs, they you know anywhere who will take them, they give them to them. Some people even pay for them, um, just to get reviews on their books. So yeah. it's not sketchy at all. I don't tell people anything to put in their review, including right. that they should put that they got a free copy. You're just okay. Will you please leave me a review, if you will? Here's honest. A, yeah. Honest review. Okay. Xavier, was there anything in there that you thinking about Dinosaur Noir and how you released it? Um, I w I'm trying to think now. Like, um, it's it's definitely good to already have people talking about your book. Um, so, um. As much as um, I could uh, have hyped the, the book initially, um, a lot of the initial people that were buying were were a lot of the authors that I that I knew that were um, had been kind of hearing this idea being passed around in the right writing circles. So um, for a little while, I, I, I was just known as the dinosaur noir guy, and I, I probably still am right now, but. Um, so it, that was kind of interesting as far as the, there already was a building hype happening about it just around um, the budding author scene because uh, most of them just wanted to see if it was a train wreck or not or if it, if it, actually, if it actually was everything that it lived up to. And uh, I feel, feel that it didn't, and those that have reviewed it and did a beta reads agree with that. So it's... Um, uh, yeah, I do think, in whatever form or fashion that you do it, um, be it uh, pre-orders, be, be, be it uh, advanced copies, and all, all those things, I think um, I, I think word has to already start getting established that you have a book and this is serious and people should be reading it. Good point. Good so, point. tips on getting reviewers? Yeah, there's been some questions in the in the comments. Uh, do you guys have a team? Um, if you don't, what are some recruiting ideas? That's my weakest point. <laughs> okay. So that would, maybe that would be a matter, Xavier. Question then: Do you, do you guys have anybody? Well, it sounds like Matt. You have quite a few people lined up. Is that true? As many as I can. I don't, that's not something I ever stop. I am constantly adding to that, yeah. So um, how do you get them? Yeah, how do you approach them? Uh, I've talked about this before multiple times on, on AuthorStrong or on other places. I think, it, I can't remember if I mentioned it on, on SPRT before. 
Um, I use Goodreads. I'll contact good people on Goodreads and give them the book for free, and uh, and then and then get them onto like a review list. Um, other than that, though, I mean, I put it in all of my newsletters. I offer if people getting my newsletter want free copies of my books, all on every single newsletter it says if you would like to review copies of my books, click here and you will get them. And that's it. So. Do you do any follow up to see if they actually reviewed it, or do you not even worry about it? Just send it to them. And... Not worth my time. Yeah. Not worth your time. Okay. Yeah. Some people will do it. Some people won't. They'll do it for some books and not for others. I mean, people have varying schedules, and it's it's a numbers game. So my goal is not to follow up on every single one of them. I can I can run like checks on my on just on the newsletter in general to see if there's people that are not opening the newsletters or not downloading the books, and those people I can remove if I need to. Um. And because they're they're not kind of participating at all, but I mean, really, at the end of the day, like some people are going to be around, some people won't, and so it's a numbers game for me. It's it's if you, even if you have a thousand people on that list, the market is so much bigger than that that you'll never hit the point where it's not worth your time to give away a free book or a review. Right. Good good point, and and it brings back the thing that we've hit on a lot on this show. Author Strong's hit on or the importance of your list, right? The your list. The bigger your list is, the better off you are. So I mean, that's been size matters. Great. Size <laughs> does matter, <laughs> and that's what she that's said. That's what she said. <laughs> Xavier, you got any tips on how to find reviewers? Um, not any one. I think that I've found a particular success in, but I think that um, I think you have to attack every angle that you can and. There's, I don't think there's any bad way to go about uh, try, trying to find readers and reviewers because um, they, they can be uh, two different things because there are people who take it seriously and, and are Amazon certified reviewers and stuff like that. Um, as much as the, there is the casual reader who is driven to write a review because they thought it was either really good or really bad. So, um, yeah, I, I've done the Goodreads thing. Uh, I've contacted people. Um, uh, there's, um, I've done Facebook groups and, and like my mailing list and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do also um, just uh, give up books in my area where I live. Um, so, like... Um, there's a, a convenience store right right down in the street where I, I I'll, I'll frequent because it's it's right by my house, um, so I g give the uh, the two guys uh, two two Pakistani gentlemen who who run the store I gave them both copies of, of the book, and um, one one of the copies of the book sits in the store, so. <laughs> awesome. it, so it's and so any any time that I'm in, in that store, and I see someone that I, that I've known and haven't talked to in a little while, and they ask how what I'm doing. I'm like, I'll turn to the guy, the guys who who own the place. I'm like, you still got my book? I want to show this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I I do think that um, yeah, there's there's no wrong way to go about it. So, uh, and and it's it's funny because a lot a lot of times you'll get a review from someone. That you know just picked it up on a free day and you would never have expected because you didn't r really uh, tr you know try to get them to review it other than your call your CDAs at at the end and stuff like that. So you already sold them on on the book. It it's just uh, and it it was them that made the dis the decision to leave the review rather than you going up to them and say hey I need a review. It, it's it you know. You never know who those reviews are actually going to end up coming from because sometimes the people that you expect to review the most, as far as you know, those people that you know, I read the book, and then it takes them about two months to post that review. So you never know. Yeah, that's 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 a good point. Um, I, I I would put myself in the the guilty party of that too. I've read you know friends books things. I even liked them. Doesn't like. You know, you, sometimes you might feel guilty if you're going to leave a bad review, but it's, it's never been that way for me. It's just been like, I'm supposed to re leave a review. Hey, I gave Sean and Johnny a three, and people are like, why did you do that? 
because it deserved a three. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. I might have just well, withheld it and said I forgot. <laughs> well, Sean later asked me if I would review, because um, it was Space Shuttle, and so he asked me if I would review the whole book because it was on the first part episode, of it, yeah. episode, and so they when they finished it, he's like, would you review the whole thing? I'll give you a free copy, because he wanted to see if they'd done better. <laughs> did you end up reading it? I did. There you and go. Did it improve? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. good. I still couldn't give it a five, because there is one specific character I absolutely hate in that book. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. All right, so a little note to self. Not giving a review copy to Chrissy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, honest reviews, they're worth something. That's true. That is yeah, true. I, would, I would much rather an honest three or an honest two or an honest one rather than um, something ridic ridiculous where someone just le leaves a chalked up review. Um, and yeah, like there, there was, there's one review that I have on, on for Dinosaur Noir that I'm not sure who who it, who it came from, from, but it just, uh, it just seems li like the the person didn't re read the book, just kind of left a random review. Yeah, I've got one of those. Or yeah. or I hate dinosaurs. One. <laughs> yeah. No, like yeah, it was just one of those bizarre things where I'm like, okay. That's, Mine was. I wish this was better. I can't wait to read more of their her books. One star. To be fair, yeah. I, want to give, I, want, I want to give every single book, and I wish this were better. Well, <laughs> I, I don't say that in a negative way. Even a five star book would be better, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, just, you know, I just wish it was better. <laughs> um, yeah, there. I loved one uh, that I got for, for um, Port of Call, which is a, a flash fiction. So it's a, it's only a thousand words. And the um, the comment was weird. Uh, yeah, weird read. Couldn't finish it. <laughs> and I'm like, it's a thousand words. You could read in like five minutes. You couldn't. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> like you got really confused by this short story. Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, that's good. And and that, and then I look at the other comments where it's just like you know, really compe compelling concept and stuff like that, and just like real thinker. And I'm like, yeah, okay, this person just did not want to think today. <laughs> <laughs> Their brain was turned off. Uh, what? Well, okay. We got off track. <laughs> yeah, I did a little bit. I'll, I'll try. I always try to, to steer us back in here. I'm navigating. Um. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the different platforms, um, and I, I know this. We could do a whole show on this, so I don't. You know, it's not to get real detailed, but mm -hmm. um, there's you know a lot of people are using some kind of aggregator like a, a draft to digital or whatever. But if you're not, what are some things that we, uh, you should be? I don't know, up on or what? You know, Amazon's going to be your main one. Matt might even make the argument it might be your only one, at least for a while. Um, what which, what does the, the new published author need to know about these platforms and how to get their books up? Some general stuff. I personally would go draft to digital. I mean, the only ones that I've, I've been able to get Kobo to work, I can't figure out Google Books to save my life. Um, and the rest of them I just go through draft to digital. It's just simpler that way. Um, other than that, I don't sell any. I, I've sold a couple of books on Kobo, and that's it. They're not. I, I'm. I would ask somebody who sells more books there for better information. Okay. Um, Matt, I I use Draft the Digital mainly because uh, on on like Apple, and I do it for Kobo because I don't really care. Um, <laughs> I do it on Apple because I keep everything anonymous, and that's the only way to keep things anonymous on Apple is mm -hmm. Draft the Digital. Um, Two, if you don't have a Mac, which I don't, you can't put on it on Apple. Yeah, you can do one of those like rent a Mac things that they have online, um, but mm. it's much easier if you actually have one. Um, I, it's it's like, what do you need to know? It, there's not too much to know because one of the reasons that all the other platforms are so crappy compared to Amazon is it's very difficult to actually sell things on them. It's very 
None of the marketing is geared towards them. They don't have the same kind of affiliate programs that Amazon has. So they don't have incentive mm-hmm. for marketers to target them. Um, the co- like things like Kobo, they're not based on sales. They're curated lists. So, right. If you want to, what do you, what should you do for Kobo? You should befriend the executives at Kobo. Like, th- that's it, and get them to to feature your stuff. And um, similar things with with Apple, where they have some really cool featured lists. And I've, I know some authors who have made connections there and have been able to kind of end up on those. Um, but at the end of the day, it really depends on what your sales are. I, I'm not going to tell everyone to go Amazon. I I only very recently went into KDP Select on everything except for perma free stuff. Um, I was on I was I was wide all the time before that. But um, it my focus was on Amazon because Amazon was always 85 plus percent of my sales. So if I'm going to focus any of my marketing time, it's going to be on Amazon because that's going to make up the bulk of my my time. It's not worth my time to even focus on the other ones. So mm-hmm. um, what do they need to know? Not too much. Everything's very similar on all the on on setting up on all the other ones. It's just going to be harder to actually market it to it. So if we're just strictly talking about how do we publish and get things on there, it's very very similar. Do Amazon first and get everything there, and then I actually keep a Scrivener file that has all my descriptions and all my like keywords and things like that. They all go into like this little marketing file for each of my books. So I have it in one centralized location, and then I can just copy and paste from that over to all the, all the other sites. Oh, okay. That, that, there's a nice little tidbit, uh, and maybe we should also. Talk about the about those keywords and stuff. Now, Xavier, do you use Draft to Digital as well? Because there are I, I don't want to sound like we're a Draft to Digital commercial. Because if they wanted us to do commercials, they could sponsor. Well, I mean, the other one is Smashwords, <laughs> and Smashwords is sucks. I also isn't. I and I, I, I feel bad. I don't know more about this, but isn't there something like Book Baby? It also does that. Yes. I think. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard of this Book Baby. I think Joanna does that one. Yeah, Joanna Penn, I think you're right. Um, but I don't know anything about it. I'm, and I'm Drafted Digital has kind of been the one lately. After mm-hmm. Well, Smashwords was the first, right? And then it, that kind of got some negative reviews and such, but we're not here to bash. But, um, we call it a meat Digital, grinder for a reason. What's that? They call it the meat grinder for a reason. They call it the meat <laughs> grinder for a reason. Yes. So draft to digital has has seems to have cornered the market quite a bit. Um, and it's just because it's easy. It, it's very simple. You fill in the boxes, you give them your stuff, and they they distribute it. It's it's incredibly intuitive and easy to do. It's just like Amazon is easy to do, and then they just push it off to the other sites. Um, Smashwords, you have to figure out how to format your stuff. In order to just to get it into their system, and then yeah. they'll give it out to the other system, the um, other sellers. So I would, yeah, I would, I would never use Smashwords to distribute to other people. It takes them a year and a half to get it there. That's the other thing. That they're works. slow. <laughs> draft to digital is pretty fast. Now, draft to digital will, will technically do it to every platform, right? It would even do Amazon. Yeah, correct? it would. But there's no point to do that because Amazon's so simple. Yeah. To be fair, once you learn them, they're all really simple. I mean. Well, when you get down yes. to a draft digital is expensive, fifteen percent on the bottom line. Um, so there's multiple factors to be considered there. If you're going to take this seriously, then learn how to do it directly to all of them. If there are other considerations, specifically Apple, because if you want to be anonymous, you can't do it direct, and if you don't have a Mac, can't do it direct to Apple. And so mm-hmm. then you could use something like draft digital. I like draft digital especially for all the minor sites like Scribd and Oyster and, and Page Foundry right. and all those other random sites. I was making a few hundred dollars on Scribd of all of them um, before I before I left it. And um, I was making more more there than I was at like Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and Apple combined, actually. Um, hey, wow. And, and no, with no marketing, right? <laughs> not zero marketing. Yeah. Never marketed to Scribd before. Um, and... And so I would, I, they are expensive. That 15% is expensive. So if all the big sites, Smashwords, uh, Apple, Kobo, Google Play, Amazon, and Barnes & Noble, those six, learn how to put them on directly. For everything else, mm-hmm. you can go easily through draft or digital um, And so it's, it's not hard once you kind of figure it out, once you get through it. There is some learning curve, and Google Play is more than frustrating. Oh, um, yeah. But, uh, More than frustrating. Like, like throw the computer out the window frustrating? <laughs> I gave up. I couldn't figure it out. I, I'm looking for a good tutorial. If anybody knows of a good tutorial for that, I will I love you forever. Gosh, you would think Google is freaking talented and 
huge as they are, it would have that dialed in. But anyway. I don't understand well why everybody just doesn't go over to Amazon, look at how they're doing it, and do something similar. I know you can't do it exactly, but come on, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh, Xavier, uh, Erica had a question, um, and actually, I think you might be the only one that could actually answer this. I don't know if anybody else is doing international stuff. Um, the yeah, Erica's uh, question um, was regarding draft to digital and international sellers. Uh, what is the inputting of tax info like? Um, no, I can't uh, speak on behalf of the draft to digital. I don't use it personally because um, I'm only uh, I'm only on Amazon right now, um, and I like like Christy said, it's so easy to just to use KDP Select and all those things. Uh -huh. um, so, um, yeah, so I do... I'm, I'm sorry, is everyone, you, you don't do Kobo, being a Canadian? I don't want to be, like, anti. <laughs> not, 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 ri not right now, other than um, the, the Flash Fiction story that I have up, um, and which it's a free story, so there's no royalty accruement, so um, I don't have to worry too much about uh, taxing there, but in general, I don't have to worry about uh, taxing from Kobo but, really at all because it is Canadian. So um, sure. with with Amazon, I do have to uh, be noting how much I'm getting, how much uh, income taxes and all that stuff. So and that ends up having to go on to, to my income tax each year. And us usually it, it's a very small, small number in comparison to what will make any kind of changes to my taxes here. But you do have to kind of look that stuff up, and um, obviously, the more successful uh, you are, the more taxes you're going to have to pay. So it's okay. it's one of those things that I I have read about some international authors um, who have had uh, overnight success, and you would think that's a great thing, but um, they weren't set up for the tax allotment and their income boosted so far that uh, they had to pay back a lot of money and they had to figure out a, a way to get around those legal things um, in order to actually be making the money that you're actually <laughs> being paid. Because hmm. right. you do have to watch out for that, that those, those things because if you are an international author and you're working for an international company, it's going to greatly affect how you, the, the two of you kind of have to c cooperate. So because both um, Amazon and uh, CreateSpace are American com companies, I have to mm -hmm. kind of play ball with them in a sense of how... how um, the taxing and stuff like that goes, and like with Create Space, you know, there's um, uh, du duty um, as far, far as when when you're shipping lar large amount of books across the co country, there's go going to be charges. So um, just for crossing borders, and you know, it's I think it was like fifteen dollars one one time that I had, uh, you know, or or like a dozen or so copies of Dice or Noir, and you know. It had got as far as to my house, and the and the guy had said, "Well, you have to uh, pay fifteen dollars for for this, you know, for the how how much it costs at the at the the border, and the fifteen dollars is just for someone to get the package, look at it, say yes, this is a package, and it's going here, and <laughs> and car and carry on, and." That, so, like, if there were, you know, a reason for them to actually have to open up a, a package and do it, then you'd be charged even more. But, so it's just funny that um, no matter what size of how many books that I that I um, order, I will always have to pay at least a, at least a fifteen dollar surcharge for it to be shipped across the border. Um, and now I've set it up so that way I have. Uh, I can't remember what the uh, the company is, but ba basically, when when packages come from uh, America to me now, I I just get 
uh, automatically build for their services charges rather than them show up at the door and be like, give me $15. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, here's a, it's a package. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's just that's just nuts. Mm. <laughs> Some things are just crazy. Um, well, uh, one more thing. Well, not one more thing. Maybe a couple more things. But the thing I wanted to hit on is something that Matt had mentioned. Um, had has a file basically set up, and it sounds like Matt. Correct me if I'm wrong. For your front matter and for your back matter, uh, for your books. Um, what sort of things are you worried about getting in there and stuff? Again, we're kind of focusing on the first time. Uh, person and get ready to push that publish button and making sure they have all their ducks in a row. Yeah, I have a I have what I call a publishing file. So I've got two file two Scrivener files I work out of. I've got a writing file and I've got a publishing file. The writing file gets everything that I'm actively working on, everything. Um, and then the publishing file is only when I'm complete. I, I have the final works in there, and mm-hmm. that's I use one file for it's got all my front matter for all my books, all my back matter for and and back matter is shared, and so. Um, for like front matter, I have different like folders and everything for each of the books in my Scrivener file, and then the back matter is just one, so I only have to update back matter in one spot, and I could re-update all my books just by recompiling them. That's a good um, idea. And so I've also in that in that Scrivener project, I've got a you know like a marketing folder, right? And in that marketing folder, I've got it broken out series, book, etc., and uh, and mainly just series. So in each series, I'll have like a book description file, and in that file, I've got each I've got a description for each of the books in that series along with keywords and categories that I've put it in. So I've got all that access to information like in one spot. Um, and that's that's really it. I mean, if, if you were going to, you could put some other things in there, like if you had some like promo stuff or like about the author type stuff, um, kind of promo things that you would be sending out to different sites that if they're going to feature you or if you're out doing, you know, book blog interviews or whatever things they ask for, like some of the media stuff. And... Um, it's good to have all of that in one spot. Um, but I also put all my book covers in there. And then, in any case, so that answers part of your question. The other part is, what should you be focused on? Um, I mean, it's hard. You want to you want to read, uh, go read Libby Hawker's uh, book on book descriptions. I'm totally blanking on the name right now. Um, some some blurbs, isn't it? Or, oh. I'll look it gotta up. Gotta read I'll, that. Yeah, gotta read that. Thank you. Gotta, gotta read, read that by Libby Hawker. Go read that, and you'll learn how to write a good book description. Now, on top of the good book description, what you also would like to do is, I mentioned earlier that you're going to be sending out to reviewers prior to getting, actually publishing the book. Any feedback they give you, any reviews they give you, you want to, I, you can put that in the marketing section, what I was just talking about, have those editorial reviews, so that when you publish it, you can put, there's all those sites, I don't, I don't know about all of them, but most of the sites have little editorial review type sections. Put that in there, so that people can get that, you know, that, that confirmation, that that proof of, of purchase, that someone else has enjoyed this book, and uh, and you want to put all of that in your marketing file so that you can have it all just in one spot. It's easily accessible, and you know where it is for everything, and you don't have to go searching. That's, That's not good. a very Michelle Reed comment. She she likes to be very chaotic with things like this, but. Um, <laughs> so that's what you don't, I have to cha- you don't have to channel Michelle. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Do you have a well, comment? he still got his camera on there, so there's that. Yeah, there's that. Oh, yeah. I, sorry, I forgot. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> all right, there we go. <laughs> Do you have a common CTA for for all your books? Uh, not for all of them. Depends on what I want him to do. Some of the books say it like probably it depends on the the name he's used, writing it under. I'll bet. No, it depends on honestly. It depends on the series and how far along they are. If I'm in the middle of a series and they get they get a link to the next book, if I'm ah. at the end of the series, they may get a link to the newsletter. Um. It depends on each one, and I just put that at the end of each book. I don't. That's not shared among all of the books. The the things that I will share, I will have like I have an ad for like joining, um, my ARC team, right? So that goes at the end of every book, so that people can know that they can get free copies of all my books. Um, I have that. I have sometimes I'll put the like my running like other books by this author, and that's getting long, so. <sighs> I'm figuring out ways to condense it or just leave it out. Like, there's some merit to leave that out and actually navigate them through books instead of giving them options. Um, oh, yeah, like lead them by hand more. Yep. Right. And, yeah. Direct them instead of instead of saying, "Hey, you could go read one of my however many whatevers." Um, go read this one. And uh, so there's some merit to that. I mean, wouldn't it be better just to to lead them to like your website or something where they can see all all of them instead of having all of them listed anymore? I mean, plus, you know, this is the next book. 
Yeah, it's a it's a styling thing. Um, I I definitely don't think that they're going to be going to your website. I think predominantly they're not going to be going to your website to buy books. They're going to be going to Amazon. And, True. Uh, and so, I, or I wherever like, they got it. Yeah, and and well, for me and for me right now, I'm I'm essentially KDP Select except for Perma Free. So they are going to Amazon. Um, yeah, so I don't necessarily like leading them. I mean, they can go back to my website if they want, but honestly, the only thing I want them to do is I want them to get on my newsletter and I want them to buy books from Amazon. That's it. Those are the two things. So ideally, I'm navigating them to one of those two things. If it's clicking on the link for the next book, they're going to the next book on Amazon, or if it's sign up for my newsletter, they're going directly to my newsletter. I don't want to send them anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So when you do that, that uh, newsletter link, it doesn't actually go to your website to fill out the box. It goes to a separate page, or how does that work? No, the newsletter link will go to my website to, okay. to sign up for the newsletter. Okay. And if it's uh, if it's uh, buy my book, if the uh, if the book is available, it goes to Amazon. If the book is not available, it goes to my website to sign up for my newsletter. Okay. Okay. Have you ever uh, thought about doing a newsletter sign-ups uh, or whatever for uh, or, or actually book reviews uh, for a, a trade? Basically, if you leave a review, I'll give you the next book free. I've heard a lot of authors be use, using that. Show me, show um, me that you left a review, then you can get the ne- next book for free. I do that indirectly through like signing up for uh, my my for my ARC list. I say I, there's a field that says give me a link to a review you've left. I don't actually check it. Um, <laughs> they just they just have to they can put it wherever they want and they get on there. Um, I'm not in the habit of like leaving people off of that if they want to be on it. Um, and so. I, I just I put that little extra step in there to make it a little bit more difficult, but it's not actually a requirement that I that I follow up on. Um, yeah, I mean, some people have had success with that, uh, and I don't do it. It's something I should consider. Um, I should I, I like the language because I already do that. I already say you can be on my review team and you can get all of my books for free. Um, but it's it's in the wording of like right there of saying you can get the next book. Go leave me a review on this, and I'll send you the next one for free. And yeah. it's, all, it's all about language. It's about the copy. And, mm-hmm. and so I, so essentially I'm already doing that, but I think that there, I could maybe better the language that I'm using to do it. Um, actually, that led me to another question, too, and uh, I'm sorry if it's Matt-centric. Actually, this could be Chrissy, too, because she has a lot of titles up. So you decide to change something in your back matter or something has changed about you or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how difficult is it to go back and update those works. It's time consuming. Um, I, I've been doing it off and on because I, well, I put out a bunch of stuff back in 2012, 2013. I did like, or 2013. Last year I did like nothing. And so this year I've been slowly updating everything and because I have them each separate files, it's taking me a lot longer. I think I'm going to steal Matt's idea of having them all one file because that sounds like a very good time saver. Um, yeah, say for me, it actually doesn't take all that long. Yeah. It's it's time consuming and especially if you, you're you're changing it constantly. Like I know the guys over on Self Publishing Podcast, they change their back matter all the time. And they've got like thousands of books, so it takes them a while. That's and, a waste of time. I don't yeah. recommend anybody do that. Yeah. <laughs> if you can get something that is streamlined and it works for you that you can leave on there, that's I I would suggest that highly. Yeah, I think anything that you can do ahead of time, be, you know, like 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 you're saying, Chrissy and Matt, like if there's any kind of uh, thing that you can get ahead of already before it's time to hit publish, like key keywords. The, the log line, you know, all all those little things. Like, I, I I'm always going to have developed my um, my log line, like my my blurb, um, probably before I've written the book. That's going to be something that's in my sh- my world notes, like like as I'm brainstorming, because not only is it like um, some something that you know it's good to have done ahead of time, but also it's like you're selling it to yourself. Mm-hmm. Because if if you're right, if you can describe it well enough to to yourself, and be like, "Yeah, I feel like writing that book. That sounds exciting." Then it's probably going to be a good enough uh, blurb for someone to read it. 
Oh, that's interesting. I don't know if I, I don't think I've ever heard that advice from you before, Xavier. So, so, so you sell it to yourself prior to you even writing the thing. Yeah. If, if it doesn't sound exciting, why would I write it? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I I definitely recommend that. Just just as one of those things that you'll notice that you'll get better at doing the, those log lines just because. You've had to convince yourself, and that, and then you can retweak it for the audience if need be. Okay, interesting. That's cool. Because um, you've already sold it to at least one person already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you buy your own book. Yeah, I always do. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like kind of like the uh, candidate. They always vote for themselves, right? I, yeah. <laughs> We're nice like that. Uh, yeah. Um, I was trying to check the site if anybody can help me out as things go flying by. Do we miss um, any questions? Anybody have any questions that we didn't capture? Um, er Erica had asked, um, is the draft to digital um, taxing program like how Amazon is where they have that like tax interview? Tax interview? Yeah, that's... Um, I don't know, yeah, yeah, I guess it, it must be something that's only applicable to the international guys. So, yeah, sorry, Erica, I, I have no answer, and I guess the, the other guys uh, won't. But yeah, <laughs> as uh, I, I can testify that um, there is a, uh, a tax interview thing that that Amazon does, and, and it's just a very like simple pop up type of thing where you just have, you know you're putting in. Your, your basic information as far as taxing and stuff like that goes, just so that way they can prove that you're a real person and that, um, t two, that they can know which, as far as which country that they are going to be participating with uh, sending the funds to. Um, so like in Canada's uh, example, there's a, a certain rate of exchange between those and... Um, and different ways of because like I can't uh, get direct deposit from CreateSpace or or Amazon as far far as um, those paperback sales. It'll only be a hundred dollar check when when you get to a a hundred dollar mm -hmm. point. So um, yeah, there's lots of different things that are uh, that you find out in that tax. Uh, I guess uh, yeah. It's an interesting uh, thing that they, Amazon requires you to do every year to update your tax information as, as far as the international authors go, just so that way they can tell that they're still dealing with a, a legit, person. yeah, a, a, yeah, a legit foreign entity. That, <laughs> so, so that they they save themselves of having the IRS on them. Mm, okay, I guess that makes sense, but sounds like it sounds like a pain in the ass, though. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a lot. Of well, things. any time you're dealing with the government, it's a kind of a pain in the ass. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> good point. Good point. Um, anything we missed? Anything that? Uh, so, are we ready? Are we ready to hit publish? Is that uh, is that what we're getting to? Have we already hit the button? <laughs> I think yeah. As a recap, just a real quick recap. I think that's it. Like you know, you finish your stuff, you send it off to editing. You finish your part of it, send it off to editing. Clean up whatever edits need to happen. Right. All the while you're doing that, try and build a list of reviewers ahead of time. You don't even need a book that's done yet. And um, and I won't go too much in, into how to do that. We can talk about it some other time if you want. Um, build a list of reviewers, and then as soon as you're ready, like everything but proofreading, send them copies of it. Get the proofreading done. You've got essentially got it done. Now you can start setting up marketing, or you can set up a pre-order. You can do all the things for that. Um, and then that's pretty much it. And, uh, and then as soon as you start actually getting reviews back, the only thing I would update is those editorial review sections, letting uh -huh. people know, you know that, that social proofing of, yes, people like this book. And then the next step would be write your next damn book. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 As soon as, yeah, you don't need to spend all your time marketing. Like, you need to be writing the next book while yeah. you're doing all that. Especially if you're doing a series. And continue building that list of reviewers. That never... Ever, ever. If you're not doing it right now, you're doing something wrong. It never yeah. stops. Apparently, I'm doing something wrong. Yes. <laughs> yep. We're all. Hey, Chrissy, we're all doing something wrong together. Just remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. hard thing to keep in mind. 
but it should never ever. If you think you're you have enough, you don't. Yep. Yeah. Because the more reviews you get, the more the better things happen for you, right? I mean. Oh yeah. Yeah. You'll know when you have enough. <laughs> you, don't have enough. <laughs> you don't have enough. Yeah, but look know. at Stephen King's. Then you might you kind of have an idea. <laughs> so. Okay. Pretty much, if you could buy uh, enough reviews to never need a mic again, then you don't you need can, them anymore. If you can launch with a thousand <laughs> reviews, I might argue you have enough. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Xavier, anything else from you? Good night, internets. 